Hello, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Where should I put myself? <laughs> Never know. Uh, welcome to the flask containerization workshop. And we have folks tuning in from, uh, you know, from YouTube. I think you're all tuning in from YouTube. You can chat either in YouTube comments or you can also head over to our FlaskCon 2023 chat if you want to chat in our palettes discord so this is a discord that is uh just always going throughout the year because it's where lots of people ask questions uh so you know we welcome to have more folks in, in that community here's the invite the discord invite for it so feel free to chat uh in both places i'll try to somehow watch both um and uh yeah so if you have any questions throughout please do post in either the Discord chat or the YouTube chat. So this is the second workshop for FlaskCon 2023. Uh, just to give context for FlaskCon, you can go to flaskcon.com. And we've got three workshops. One of them happened earlier today while I was asleep. This one we're doing now. And then there is one tomorrow for learning Flask the hard way with architecture patterns. Then tomorrow, most of the day is talks. And these start real in the middle of the night for me. <laughs> they start at 7 UTC. Uh, so we're, hopefully there's a time that works for everyone, uh, you know, across all the time zones. So they'll start at 7 UTC and then go till 21 UTC um, with a lot of really, really interesting talks. So we hope to see you uh, come back tomorrow for the talks and workshops tomorrow. All right, so for today's workshop, these are, this is the slide deck I'm working off of, so I will post it here. I encourage you to follow along and you can keep that, that slide link forever. So what I will be talking about is first starting off with just an intro to Docker and the terminology around Docker, Docker 101. So if you've done a little Docker before, you know, that'll be a review for you. But if you haven't done it, then welcome to Docker and containers. Then we'll talk specifically about how do we containerize a simple Flask application and run that container. Uh, and we'll have an actual exercise and we're going to see what it's like to do an exercise, you know, on, on YouTube. And I might invite my colleague up to, to go through it. Uh, then we're going to talk about how you can have databases in containers using Docker Compose and then run multiple containers. So that's the goal for what to cover today. And if you are going to be participating, like if you're going to be trying to follow along or doing, you know, and doing the exercises, the this is the recommended prerequisites, like the, you know, environment setup. There are basically three options. One is that you could do everything in GitHub code spaces. So I've set up all my examples so they work in GitHub's code spaces. So that means if you have a GitHub account, you can start up a code space, you know, for free as long as you haven't gone over your 60 hours a month. And then uh, you can even you can run the Docker commands even in code spaces. So that's a entirely in the browser VS Code experience. Uh, so that's a great option if you don't want to deal with setting up your local environment. Uh, Another option is to do local development with VS Code because I have also optimized the samples to work with that. And there I would recommend having Docker Desktop. So if you're going to work on your desktop, you need Docker Desktop at the, at the bare minimum, okay? So Docker Desktop, if you want to get this working locally, then you need Docker Desktop. So go ahead and start downloading now if you don't already have it. And if you do want to use VS Code, then I recommend VS Code with the dev containers extension, um, but it's not strictly necessary. So the big thing is either use GitHub code spaces or get Docker desktop. That those are That's the takeaway here. And that's if you want to follow along. You're also welcome to just watch and take it in, whatever you want to do. So let's start off with talking about Docker. And uh, here's a you know an overview here. So we have the Docker engine, 
And the Docker engine is, you know, a piece of software that sits in your operating system and knows how to run Docker containers. And each of those containers is an isolated environment. And that's the beauty of Docker is the ability to create these isolated environments. Uh, so here you can see we've got, you know, your operating system is running on particular hardware, and then the Docker engine is running on top of the operating system. And that Docker engine can be running any number of containers, and each of those containers has their own app code and binaries and all that stuff. So this is really useful when you have, you know, projects that have very different environments and you don't you know want to have to deal with having all these environments just on your you know your base machine uh, so we could be running a django app with postgres in one container and we could be running a rails app with mysql in another container and actually where it becomes even more useful is if you're running two containers with very similar but subtly different environments so imagine you're running Django 4.0 with Postgres 14 in one container. And then the other one, you're running Django 5.0 with Postgres 15. That sort of thing would be really, really annoying to get to be able to handle locally on your machine without containers. But with containers, it's it's no problem at all, right? So I actually think it's particularly useful, uh, even if you're just a Python developer, just with multiple projects, because you can have subtly subtle different requirements between, you know, the the language, like the Python version, the database version, all that stuff. <laughs> so yeah, so you know, we're talking a bit about, you know, that that's a big advantage of using Docker is that we can set up these isolated environments and um, you know, not have to worry about them colliding with each other. Now we're Python developers, so we're, uh, you know, probably used to using Python virtual environments. And I get this question a lot about the difference between, you know, a virtual environment and a full on Docker container. So a virtual environment is a great thing to do. It's a great practice with a Python virtual environment. You can create this, uh, you know, a virtual environment that's tied to a particular Python version and has a particular set of Python dependencies. So that's great for your Python environment. But an application often has more than just Python language, Python environment. An application often is bringing in databases and services, and all of those will have their own particular versions and requirements. And so that's that's you know where you want to go one level up with Docker, where you can really control the the entire environment. Uh, so yeah, so you know why do folks use Docker? So other other things to talk about here. Uh, it's great to be able to have a consistent environment across multiple environments, right? Because in the past, we've had this problem, you know, where it's like, oh, it worked on my machine. And then, and then my colleague tried and it didn't work, or we put it in production and it didn't work, right? Because things were subtly different between those environments. If you make a Docker container, there's much more consistency and, you know, replicability to that environment where it's like, okay, well, if this works on my machine and I'm using that same Docker file, that same Docker uh, image, then that should work in, in production. So you can, you know, have this much greater consistency by declaring everything about your environment uh, inside a Docker file. Uh, application portability. So this is actually really great for being able to run containerized applications in the cloud. Right. So if you're, you know, if you've deployed a container on a particular machine and if that machine just fails or if you need to scale up your application to more users, it's easy because you you're it's all Docker. Right. It's not a complicated setup script. You just say, oh, OK, well, run this, you know, run this container on on a new machine right, and run it on this other machine. So uh, that's why a lot of clouds really like and support containerized applications because they're fairly portable, fairly, there's a, a known way of getting them started across multiple machines and handling machine fails. And now finally, there's a sustainability perspective. Uh, so, you know, if you're concerned about efficient use of hardware and you're thinking of all the data centers out there that are chugging along and using, you know, too, manage, um, too much energy, by using containers, you can run multiple containers on the same machine. So you can imagine a cloud provider could run, you know, 20 different applications as a machine if they don't, you know, if they're not servicing a lot of traffic. So that's a more efficient use of hardware. It's an easier way of uh, splicing up a machine so that we can have, uh, you know, a better, more efficient use of hardware. So there's, there's a nice sustainability perspective there too. 
So, you know, hopefully you're convinced. Lots of good reasons for uh, for using Docker. Uh, so let's keep talking about terminology. All right. So we have something called Docker images. So the, there's a con container image is the software package that includes everything needed to run an application. And then a container is a running instance of a container image. So you would have one container image, but you could have multiple containers that are running that image. Uh, so, you know, for example here, if we have this Django container, which, uh, you know, uh, sorry, this Django image that defines, uh, you know, everything that's in the package and actually has everything in here, we can then run that, you know, we can run that once, but we can also run that multiple times, right? So, you know, all these containers here could all be run from the same image. Uh, and that's how you could get like scalability, right? If you're, you know, if you needed to, uh, you know, have serve more users, you could run lots of containers from the same image and even run those across multiple machines, a cluster machines, et cetera. Then we have image registries. So a registry is a place where you can store and share images. Now there is actually a lot of public registries because there's lots of images that people want to, you know, that many people want to use. So we can take a look at Docker Hub. This is probably the well most well-known one. So if we search here and we search for Python, we can see that there is a Python official image and, uh, and we can look at the tags. So images generally have tags and these tags are like slight variants of it, right? So typically you do wanna use a specific tag because it has a different setup. So you can see there's a 3.13, which is exciting because 3.13 is not yet a stable version, uh, but most likely we would wanna use like a 3.12, right? So you could actually like filter the tags here and see, okay, 3.12. Uh, and you can take a look at a particular image and this is really cool. You can actually see what it's what's it made what it's made of, and you can see the packages inside of this. This is something I found pretty helpful too to see, like why does you know why you know okay so you can see this one has SQLite three, so it's just SQLite is just going to work, but maybe it doesn't have something else that we need, and so then we have to install that additional package. Uh, so you can see yeah vulnerabilities packages. Uh, so it's a they have a really cool image. Explorer uh, when you're trying to decide what images to use. Uh, so definitely, you know, browse around Docker Hub. You can find other images, you know, from, you know, Mongo. There's a Mongo image. That's, you know, it says official on it. There's a Postgres image. We're going to be using that one today. Uh, you know, lots of, lots of options here. And, and then we've got some other container registries as well. These ones are more typically used, you know, kind of for more private use, right? So there's GitHub container registry. So you might want to like have a CI that pushes something to the GitHub container registry. That would be a common use of it. There's an Azure container registry. And uh, that's if, you know, you commonly use if you're going to deploy to Azure. There's an AWS one if you're deploying to AWS. There's a Google one if you're deploying to Google. So you, you see that a lot of the big clouds have their own container registry. And that's because, you know, if you're going to be deploying a container to, uh, you know, to one of those clouds, it makes sense to put the image in the cloud to somewhere. But also there's lots of portability. So for all of these clouds, if you want to deploy an image from Docker Hub or from even your private registry, because you could have a private registry, you can totally do that. So there's lots of options, but also lots of like, you know, compatibility with each other and swappability because your your image could be could be anywhere, right? The big question is, is it a public image or is it a private image? Because if it's a private image, then uh, you know, you do need to have an authentication to be able to access that registry. And there's, you know, different ways that you can authenticate. Uh, so, so yeah, so that's an image registry. It's a place to store and share your images. And um, we can use it for public ones. We can use it for private ones. Hello, people in the chat. We got Scuba Sarah, John, and Calico. Let's see if we also, okay, so we've got everyone doing YouTube, not Discord. Hey, all right. Hi, everyone. Going pretty well here. Cool. Yeah, I haven't seen any questions yet, but also maybe all of you already already know this. Um, and also feel free to, you know, just uh, answer each other's questions too. 
so let's talk about an image. So an image starts off with a base image and then it adds layers on top of it, right? So a really common thing is to start off the base image, you know, some sort of usually a Linux image, right? So a base image here, we could have Ubuntu, that's a uh, version of, of Linux, and so we could have a version, so Ubuntu 20.04. And then uh, we might have a layer where we install Python on top of that image, and then a layer where we install Flask as a dependency, and then a layer where we install our app actual application code. And the reason that it's important to think about this in layers is because Docker can actually cache each of the layers. And that improves performances when you're when you're building images. So you do want to keep in mind, like think of your think of your image in terms of its layers, and think in terms of like what's going to change the most often and what's not. So that's why you typically have the final layer is your application code because that's probably going to change the most op often, right? And then your Python dependencies those might change fairly often. Your Python version that's probably not going to change very often. Maybe once a year, a couple times a year. And then your base image, you know, probably you're only going to change that if, you know, there's some security issue and you're upgrading. So uh, you think in terms of, you know, how frequently each layer is going to change. And that's typically the order of installation. And sometimes the order of installation is just because, you know, in order to install Flask, you need Python, right? So there's a dependency there too. Um, and so you got to think about both those things. Like what are the dependencies and how frequently are these things changing? Okay, so that was a bunch of Docker terminology. Now we're gonna switch gears to talk about uh, just a, how we would productionize, get a, get a simple, very simple Flask application ready for production, uh, just so we see what we're going to containerize. Uh, so, you know, if this is FlaskCon, you're probably fairly familiar with Flask. So this is gonna be a really, really bare bones uh, Flask container so that we have an example. So this is the repository I'm gonna work with for this part of the workshop. So what I can do is I can make a GitHub code space. So if you want to do the GitHub code space route, you click on code and you say create code space on main, that opens a new window and it starts building a code space. And here's the funny thing, a code space is also a Docker container. Everything in the world now, is Docker containers. <laughs> so this is actually, you can see it says building a container. This is actually building a container for the development environment, which is different from the container we're gonna build inside this code space. So maybe there's too many containers in the world, but uh, everything runs on containers these days. So I can also open this, uh, I've got this also open locally. So I'm gonna try and show both, uh, all the options. So you see um, how things work. Uh, so you can see while, so the one thing about Codespace is that it does have to build a container. So that does take a few minutes, depending on how many layers there are in the image, right? How complex the container is, whether it's got those layers cached. This one should actually be a fairly, fairly quick one to, to build because it doesn't, this Docker container doesn't have too many um, necessities. But once again, this is building the development container that we're going to use, the dev container. Uh, which is different from the application container. Um, so that's building. Uh, I've also got it uh, opening up here in VS Code. Uh, I guess while that's building, we have a question in the chat, which is why would somebody want a private image? So <clears throat> actually lots of people would want a private image because uh, if you're making a application, most people's app web applications are not. Uh, you know, open source and publicly usable and, and all that stuff, unfortunately. Uh, so, you know, uh, probably most of your application images, you would store those in a private registry. Uh, there are a few examples I've seen of, um, like, there's this app called Baby Buddy. Uh, I have a, a, well, I guess not a baby anymore. I have a 18 month old. Uh, but you can see this app here. This is a Python app. I can't remember. I think it is Flask, but it might be Django. Um, but they have their image. They do have an image available publicly to make it easy for people to uh, to build this image. So deployment. And they are using, you can see here, this is the image. So they're using this lscr.io, which is yet again another public uh, image registry. 
building and maintaining community images. So if you're, you know, if you're creating some open source software, this might be another option for you. And that's what, you know, baby buddy uses here. So this is another example of a public image. Uh, most images that you all are probably going to be building for the applications you're working on are probably going to be private images stored in a private registry and you're going to authenticate to that registry somehow. <clears throat> all right. So the code space is now started up. Uh, so <clears throat> first thing we're going to do is just run this Flask application. So we're just going to do the Flask app run command that we know and love. So you can see I'm running on port 50505, which is my favorite port. <laughs> the only one that uses it. <clears throat> and I'm running into bug mode. So that should auto reload when we have updates. And here you can see my super amazing website. Okay. So it's running. Great. <laughs> the next step is that we are trying to figure out how we would run this potentially in production. Because when we're making containers, we're both making them for local use, but we're also usually making them uh, for, for production use uh, so that we can you know, deploy a container to the cloud. So we should not be using the Flask server for production use. You can see this big old warning here. This is a development server. Do not use it in a production deployment. Use a production WSGI server instead. Well, everyone's favorite production WSGI server is probably, for Python, is G-Unicorn. Uh, it does have a unicorn logo, which is the only thing my family cares about right now because I have a four-year-old daughter. Uh, so we have G-Unicorn, which is a production-level WSGI server. And that is what most people uh, use. So to use that, we need to add G-Unicorn as a dependency here. Uh, so we have that in our requirements.txt. We can see that here. OK. And I'll quit my dev server. And then we can use G-Unicorn to run the Flask app. And what you can see in this command is that I give it a path to the app. I tell it to use four workers. So this is something you can do with Unicorn that you can't do the Flask Dev Server is you can actually do multiple workers. And that's the sort of thing you definitely want to do in production in order to be able to serve lots of users, um, you know, especially if you have multi-core machines. And then I also tell it the port to bind to. And let me go ahead and share the slides where we're at, because I know some people joined later. So I want to make sure you have access to these slides. And um, also, I'll do a, a quick link to the container, if you just want a quick link to the repo that I'm currently working through. <laughs> I see a question about how I write my slides. These are, I do write HTML slides hand by hand. I love HTML. I'm one of those weirdos that loves HTML. Uh, if you are interested in HTML slide, I have an HTML slide for uh, talking about how to do HTML slides. So uh, here you go. I even, it's it was even a, a, um, a 6C, a 6C uh, presentation. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, here you go. Okay. Yeah. So if you are interested, where is it? Okay, I'll find it here. Uh, oh, here you go. Here are my slides. I feel like this must have a GitHub URL here. Oh my gosh. All right. All right. I'll find that later. But this is this is a slide about writing slides. <laughs> okay, so that was an aside. Um, all right, so going back here. So what you can see is that G-Unicorn is running and it is binding to 50505, my favorite port. And you can see it has started up four workers. So now we can visit that port and uh, we can see that it's running. It looks the same as before. Great, it is working. The difference here is that we're using a production level server, G-Unicorn, in order to run it. Now, you can configure GeoInCorn this way by passing in, you know, command line arguments. Uh, but uh, what I really prefer is to do a geunicorn.conf.py, stick that in the root of your application. GeoInCorn will automatically find it. 
if you have uh, if you have called it exactly that, or you could call it something else and tell Geonicorn where to find it. But this way you can write your configuration in Python. So here you can see uh, that you, we actually are defining particular variable names that Geonicorn is looking for. And uh, we've got a few more parameters here. So we're doing this like max request, max request jitter. These are some best practices. Uh, the really interesting thing that we do here is that we calculate how many CPUs are in the current system, and we use that in order to determine the number of workers and the number of threads. And there's documentation at GUnicorn that you know talks about this formula of CPU count times two plus one. That's the general best practice. You could do some load testing experiments using Locust if you want to make sure that's actually working well for you. But this is what we tend to do in our Whiskey apps for GUnicorn. So that's a big benefit of having this gunicorn.com.py is being able to do this dynamic calculation here. Uh, yeah, so I see question is, does each worker serve one user or can each worker serve multiple users at the same time? Uh, so that's a good question. So you see, I have both workers and threads. Um, so this one actually, it does do, I think this, th okay. So gunicorn has multiple worker classes. Uh, and so each of them has like slightly different, um, you know, ways that they work. But if we look at the, I'm trying to find worker classes. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, let's see. Okay. Choosing a worker type. Okay. This is the really, this is what you want to read. Um, so yeah, so the, the default synchronous worker assumes that your application is resource bound in terms of CPU and network bandwidth. And um, it, this is the documentation here about the number of workers and number of threads. Uh, using threads assumes use of the gthread worker. So if you use the gthread worker, and now I'm forgetting whether that's a default or not. Hopefully it is. Otherwise, it'll just ignore the threads option. Uh, so if you use the gthread worker, then it can, each worker can do multiple threads. Uh, if not, then it, the, that threads argument won't do anything and each worker will only handle one. So that's a good question. This is also why lots of people are moving from Flask to Quart. Because if you are having like really long running network requests, like, you know, big long requests to your database or to an API, then you really do want to use an asynchronous framework because then while it's waiting for that response, it can handle more requests. I have a blog post about that. Um, uh, fairly recently, is this it? Yeah, concurrency. Uh, so, you know, typically a worker, you know, can, is only handling one request. If they have no threads, they're only handling one, uh, or you can think of each thread as handling one. Uh, but if you're using an asynchronous framework, while a worker is waiting for a response, it can start handling another request. Uh, so I do recommend thinking about whether uh, your particular application, you know, lends itself to using uh, an asynchronous framework like Quart, you can port from Flask to Quart fairly easily, depending on how many extensions you're using. Um, if you're using lots of extensions, it might be hard. But if you're using basic Flask, then you can port to Quart uh, by just by, like putting async in front and away in front of lots of things. Uh, and let me also link to the GUnicorn docs here. So I definitely recommend reading through the Unicorn docs. I've read through them multiple times because I just always need a good reminder. All right, great questions. If you are doing, uh, if you are going to do fast API, if you're going to do Quart, then I, you know, slightly change my recommendation here. Uh, but I actually usually still use Unicorn, but I use it with the Uvicorn worker. So you can use a Uvicorn worker to be able to handle asynchronous. So if you are doing a asynchronous app, so you're using Quart or Fast API, then you either need to use Gunicorn with the Uvicorn worker, or you need to use Uvicorn straight, or you could even use Hypercorn, which is another uh, ASCII server. Okay. Uh, so if we do, if we have this gunicorn.conf, then we can just, you know, just do the basic command and it is automatically finding that configuration, doing the calculation. You can see there's one more worker this time because it did this calculation of CPU count, which must be two on this particular uh, machine, uh, and then adding one. So it did five, five workers. 
Okay, so we've got our last gap. We know how to use G-Unicorn. Now let's actually put it in a container. Oh, we do have another question. Okay, <laughs> so yeah, I talked briefly about load testing and I referenced Locust. So load testing means uh, sending a bunch of load at your app and seeing how it handles it. Uh, and I've done it for Flask apps. I've done it for Court apps. Actually, I did it for a Flask app, determined that it <laughs> wasn't handling it well due to the need for concurrency, ported it to Court, and then redid the load test, and it worked a lot better. Uh, but that's just because of that particular app really needed an asynchronous framework. So yeah, I do recommend uh, using Locus. It's just throwing a bunch of traffic at your app and seeing how it handles it, seeing if you have any unexpected server errors. Um, so this is the kind of thing you want to do with your app once it's once it's actually deployed to production. That's typically when you want to do it because you usually are trying to see how it's going to handle, you know, user facing traffic. Now, profiling is different. Profiling is actually identifying where the bottle marks are in your code. Uh, so if you do want to do profiling, you can go uh, use... Let's see. There's so many things called scaling. Scaling is a great profiler for Python, for which would work for Flask. Uh, if you're doing asynchronous, sorry, I'm doing like a lot of asynchronous plugs here. <laughs> this is another bad search. Uh, Yappy. Yappy is what I've been using lately when profiling my court applications. And it, this one would also work for, should also work for Flask. All right, great topics. Okay, so now we will talk about containerizing Python apps. So these are the basic containerization steps. The first thing is to write a Docker file. The next thing is we're gonna build an image based off that Docker file. And then finally, we're gonna run a container using that built image. And then we could run any number of containers. So a Docker file starts off with the base image. And so here you can actually see the, the Docker file syntax on the right side, okay? So this is the line that describes the base image that you're using. And you're typically gonna get, a, you know, your base image is usually gonna be like an, a, a, you know, a Linux um, you know, variant uh, or maybe even a Python base image. So if you're making a, a Python application, it usually makes sense to start with a Python base image because it's got a lot of good Python stuff set up for you. So you don't have to worry uh, about that. And you can specify your Python version. So here we can do Python 3.11. You can get more specific, specific than that. Remember, we went to Docker Hub, we looked at the tags. So, you know, it's up to you how much specificity you want with the tag. Um, but, uh, you know, here we're making sure we get at least the 3.11 version. The next thing we do is we install any additional software. Lots of times this will be lots of lines. In this case, I'm just having this one line here, which does a pip3 install flask unicorn. Uh, pip3 only works because I'm using the Python image. It wouldn't work on like just a base uh, image without pip, uh, but that should work with the Python image. Then we need to copy over the application code. So this first line here, work dir code says, this is the working directory for, um, you know, the, it says make this directory if it doesn't exist and set this as the working directory for every command going forward. All right. So basically you can imagine that it's now made this directory and we are in that directory now. Uh, so the next thing it does is it copies everything in the current folder, wherever we are, into that code folder. That's what copy dot dot does. Um, this next line here, expose, exposes ports. So if, you know, you, you think of each container, it kind of has this like internal network. If you want to expose those ports so that you can hit a port, um, you know, from outside that container, you need to explicitly expose it. So if I'm telling G-Unicorn to run it 50505 inside the container, but I also want to be able to hit it uh, at that um, port outside it, I need to explicitly expose that port here. Then finally, we have the command that's going to run when a container launches. So this one's a little different from the rest. These, you know, these here, these are all gonna happen when building the image. Entry point is only gonna get run when an actual container is run based off this image. And this is usually just what you want to happen 
when you know when it starts up and usually if it's an application you actually want to you know start up the application if it's a database you usually want to start up the server right so it's some sort of startup script for whatever is on this image and it has this funny syntax here where it's actually in a in a list <laughs> so you specify you break your argument up into uh, a list of the parts and that saves it from having to do the parsing itself uh, but this is basically the same command that we just did, gunicorn-c, give me the, the comp file. And you don't even, I could just do gunicorn app app and it would automatically find this because it's named correctly. Yeah, oh, I see a question about pip installation. In this slide, I'm installing them, I'm installing them, uh, you know, directly. But actually, you're right. In my in my actual code, I install from requirements, but it, it's a little more complicated. So I wanted to show this simplified version before I show that. But it's a really good question because that's it's going to get a little more complicated. So let's go ahead and look at the real Docker file. It's just like it's only a little bit more complicated. So uh, here, I first so actually it looks like I moved my work directory up here um, uh, so that I could do this here. So the first thing I do is copy the requirements.txt into that directory. And then I install those requirements and then I copy the everything. There, you might say like, well, why don't I just do copy dot dot here? The reason is because of that caching. Because remember, this is gonna get cached in layers. So by doing this, Docker can cache this layer as long as requirements.txt doesn't change. So if requirements.txt doesn't change and Docker, you know, we tell Docker rebuild the image, it's going to use this layer from the cache. And then it could also run, use this layer from the cache if nothing, if nothing changed, right? So that is why we, we split up the copy is because requirements change less frequently than application code. Uh, so this is typically what I do is I actually, I do have requirements.txt. So you can see the requirements.txt here. I first copy that over. I do the pip install based off that and then copy the rest of the code in. Great, yeah, these are great, great observations that everyone's having here. All right, yep, there's the real one. If you are interested in layers and caching, uh, I found this great tutorial about it because I got a lot of good questions about it when I've done this workshop in the past, so I will you know, link to this here. It's also linked from the slides. Um, there's always more to learn about Docker. <laughs> so I consider myself like <laughs> still like a fairly Docker beginner. Um, I'm always learning more about it. Another thing we want to do is we do want a Docker ignore file uh, because when we do the build, we don't necessarily want it to build everything into that image, right? We don't want it to, to build in our Git history. Uh, if we had a virtual env, we don't want it to copy that. We don't want it to copy over, you know, Python cache files. So you put a lot of stuff in your Docker ignore that you just don't want it to build. This usually is very similar to your Git ignore, but not necessarily exactly the same. So, um, you know, just think about what is it that you don't want to get put into your built image. Okay, so let's actually build this image. So we're using the Docker command. You should have this if you've got Docker Desktop installed. You should have this. I'll show this on my machine and and in the code space. So we're doing Docker build, and we're giving it a tag, uh, which is basically the the name of it, and we're telling it to build, you know, just based off of the root folder that we're in. So what it's going to do? It's going to look for a Docker file inside the the root let me get even bigger okay so now we can watch it building and this is kind of fun uh so you can see it's you know building uh it's extracting the python 311 image uh and right now it's basically doesn't have things cached because i started up this is a fresh code space there's nothing cached let's try this in my local machine because i might have more stuff cached here we'll see if it's faster i think i i think i recently built this we'll find out look at this <laughs> i did i built it this morning so it is very fast if you have already built it because you see here it says cached 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 
it's like all cash. Now let's see what happens if like, you know, we've changed, uh, you know, change something in here, right? And then we re rebuild it. And this time you see that it does have to do the copy step because that, it, you know, it realized that it couldn't use what was from cash. Now let's try changing requirements. Let's say that I want to use um, uh, click. Actually, isn't plus, I don't know. Is it click in plus? I don't know. Uh, but, you know, I bring in a requirement, okay? And then I build again. And we're going to see what it ends up getting from cash. So this time we see it could, you know, it could only, the only one it could cash was just the idea of making a work di working directory, which, you know, is a very quick thing. And it had to redo everything from the uncached point. So this is the big, you know, big dis you know, point I want to make with the layer caching is that, you know, when something changes, it has to redo that step and everything forward which is why you do want to be really careful about the order that you do things. Uh, if you're gonna be you know, building images a lot and you want them to be fast rebuilds. It only matters for rebuilds. You know, Your first image, if there's nothing cached, it's, it's always gonna do everything. And then if I do it again, now this time everything should be cached. Yeah. All right, let's go back here. So the code space had to do everything from scratch. So you can see that it did take uh, you know, a fair amount of time. The the biggest time was just getting that Python image down. Uh, the rest was actually not that slow. All right, so we have now built an image. Uh, so we can look at that image. Uh, so I'm going to look, bring up, I have a Docker extension for VS Code. Um, so that extension lists images. So we can see images here. And uh, you can see it gives like the image name and then the tag. So if we, you know, because here we did tag Flask app, that's actually kind of like the name plus the tag. If we wanted to be explicit, we could say Flask app latest. We could give it a version number. You know, this is my 3.11 version. And uh, if we do that, then we'll see it. We'll actually see two versions show up here, two tags. Uh, so I think of this as like, this is the name and these are the tags for it. Uh, usually when I'm developing locally, I'm just making, I just do default to latest. So you can just leave it off or you can be explicit and say colon latest. All right, now, so that's what it looks like in VS Code. Uh, we can also take a look at locally because I've run, I've done it locally. So I'll bring up my DOS, Docker desktop here. And I've got maybe too many things going on here, but let me go and look for... There we go. This is the one I built. You can see I built 39 seconds ago. There was also one I built two hours ago when I was testing this. Um, so uh, yeah, I guess I slightly changed the name. That's why we see these two, two ones. Otherwise, if it was the same name, it would just overwrite it. So these are just the images, okay? So these images have a size. You see the size here, one gig. And if we look at my total size, I'm actually using 10 gigs for my images. So if you are, you know, you if you have lots of images, you potentially are using up a lot of space. Uh, and when you're storing something in an image registry, you're actually using up a lot of space because you're storing like a one gigabyte image in that registry or more, right? Like my bigger images are like, what's my biggest one is three gig, oh, 10, 10 kilobytes, smallest. So my biggest one is three gigs. My smallest one is 10 kilobytes, which cracked me up. Uh, so big variance in size there, but... Uh, if you are going to store this in image registry, you are actually storing a, a fairly large thing. That's why image registries do usually cost money because you're storing things there and, and causing bandwidth and uh, upload bandwidth and download bandwidth. Uh, and it also means this can use up space on your machine. So I highly recommend getting the Docker disk usage extension. This is super useful. You just go to add extensions and you search for this. I told the Docker team that they should make this default because it is just so useful. Uh, it's still loading the um, the calculations. There we go, it loaded in. So it gives you this pie chart where you can see, uh, I'm, you know, I'm spending 10 gigs on images, 15 gigs on containers, and 11 gigs on local volumes. And then it's got this brilliant reclaim space button. And you can tell it, I usually just check everything. I'm not gonna check it right now because I'm in the middle of a workshop, um, but it'll, it, you know, if you really, you know, are, are running out of space. Um, you can see at the bottom how much space usage you have for your Docker of what you've allocated, then it will delete all these things for you. And usually that's fine because usually you can just rebuild, right? It'll take some time, but you can just rebuild. 
So highly recommend this disk usage extension for Docker desktop, super useful. I see some questions. Why are images uh, huge while well, the same thing installed is smaller? Uh, well, you could take a look at like, you know, what's actually in it. Cause in a particular image like Python 3.11. Uh, so a lot of it is about the base image, right? Um, let's, so let's look at Python and let's see, hopefully they've got the sizes here. 3.11. Okay. So you can see the size of this one, but they also have a, um, a slim. Can I get it to pull up slim, slim, slim. Okay. So if you do want it, uh, you know, so these are things you can, you can customize. If you do want a smaller base image, uh, you can see this one is actually, uh, so slim bullseye. It is only 45 megabytes. That is really slim actually, uh, but it's going to have a lot few, fewer packages. Um, so you can see, you can see now you can actually see what the, you see here is actually the layers, the Docker file. Uh, so you can see what a particular image does. And uh, if you do want to be slim, uh, I'm trying to, now I need to remember what is the difference with slim versus the other one. I think they describe it down here. Uh, slim, 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 slim. Okay. Uh, so in the non-slim variants, there's an additional distro provided Python executable. Oh yeah, actually, I find that annoying. I don't like when there's multiple Pythons in my in my Docker container. Okay, so if you do a slim variant, you only have one. Oh, and here here's the descriptions. Okay, so here are the descriptions of the you know various tags. So this image does not contain the common packages contained in the default tag, and only contains the minimal package needed to run Python. Uh, unless you're working in an environment where only the Python image will be deployed, we highly recommend using the default image. So they don't recommend using slim, but if you were really, really going for small image size and that was a big deal for you, then you could explore whether slim was, uh, you know, had everything you needed. Um, but I've certainly like tried to use this and then found like, oh, it doesn't have this one thing I need. Uh, so I usually do not use slim, but uh, it's, it's an option for you. Uh, you know, so why is it big? It just, they do have a lot of useful utilities on them. They've got the whole Ubuntu image as well. So you know, it adds up. You'll also notice this funny bookworm bullseye, bookworm bullseye. These are versions of the underlying, um, is it Debian? I think it's Debian. Yeah, Debian version. So Debian versions have names, I think, based off of Pixar movies. And <laughs> they're getting into rather obscure characters now. So yeah, we can see that uh, we've got this bookworm was the June 10th, 2023 version. Bullseye was the one right before that. And then Trixie and Forky are coming up very excitingly. So if you wanted to be really specific about your uh, Debian version, and you might want to, because there are legitimate differences between them, then you could go, you know, into, uh, you know, into your thing here and you could say, okay, I want bookworm, right? And, and then you could try uh, building with bookworm in instead. Uh, I think in this case, it actually probably defaults to Bookworm right now. So let's say you needed an earlier version because there was something wrong with Bookworm. Then you could tell it to pull based on Bullseye. So this is kind of like, you know, when we pin our requirements in a requirements file, right? Uh, you know, it's a, usually best practice to pin so you don't have unexpected breakages. It probably would be a good idea to pin your Debian version as well so that you don't have unexpected changes and so that you explicitly decide to upgrade from one Debian to the other. As long as you have a you know process in, in place to make sure you upgrade from Bullseye to Bookworm. These are all from Toy Story. I think you're right. These are, <laughs> there's so many characters just in Toy Story. Uh, I recently rewatched every Toy Story movie. They definitely vary in their quality. Some of them are classic, some of them are not. Okay, so yeah, so that's something to keep in mind is exactly which Python base image do you want? Do you have space constraints? How are you gonna manage upgrading across Debian versions? Let me see if there were other questions. Um, is there a situation where you would use a Docker container and a virtual environment? I 
personally find them to be redundant. I actually do have situations where I do it only for consistency with other folks that may not may not be using the Docker container, <laughs> but that's just for our for development environments, local development environments. In production, hey, um. Yeah, I think once again, the only reason you would do it in production is if it was for some sort of consistency across, um, you know, you know, non Docker and Docker environments. Like the virtual environment might, you know, could increase the level of consistency. So I'm thinking in terms of like as your app service, when you do deploy, it makes a container, but it does actually make a virtual environment inside that container, um, and. Uh, and then installs a bunch of requirements in there, but that's because it's um, you know it it's can it's trying to set its things up in such a way that it's safer for you, can customers to be able to deploy to app service with just a requirements.txt, and and it's just more likely to work. Um, but I think if you're controlling everything, like if I'm deploying a containerized app to a container host. I do not bother with a virtual environment. Uh, I think this is maybe a personal decision. So anyone in the chat can look, <laughs> you're welcome to comment about whether you, you do use VM with containers. I I personally try not to. That's a great question though. All right, we did have a question with Abdullah. When you do copy, we'll also copy the VM folder. That folder content is really massive in size. Well, uh, that is why I have dot vm in my docker ignore so if i did make a virtual m for developing this it would not copy that over so it wouldn't copy any of these things it's just going to straight up pretend that these things do not exist so that's why it is important to create a docker ignore file that has these you know big things that you don't want to be brought in okay so we do have yeah so scuba sarah says you know that they 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 use both uh, so yeah, I think if you're, it, the biggest reason is having compatibility. If you are, if you do happen to be switching between a containerized environment and a non-containerized environment. So I do think it's probably the most common with local development where sometimes you might be containers, sometimes not. Uh, and sometimes people you're working with are not using a container. Uh, but I don't know about in production, whether that's as common. All right. So let's see, we have a billion tabs open. So let's close a few and see where we're at. All right, so we were talking about Docker build. Uh, and now we've built the image. We need to actually run a container based off that image. So we're gonna use that Docker run command and we're gonna pass in a publish argument. So what this does is say, hey, you know, if there's an, ex you know, this exposed port 50505, I want you to also publish that on the local network of this machine. Uh, so we need to do that for a web app because we're trying to expose that web app to to the world or at least to my local world okay so i'm going to do this docker run and you see that was actually very fast all that had to do because it can you know image is already built that is just launching the container and running the entry point so you saw that was actually quite fast uh so now we can see that it is running and it works just like before uh, I'll try this locally as well to show the local uh, local experiments. So you can see in VS Code, we now see that a container has showed up. And for the containers, it gives them the, like random names. Because remember, you can have multiple containers of the same image, right? Uh, so it needs to give them different names if you've got multiple running. So we're going to run this one here. And you can see it booted more workers because I've got more CPU core on my local machine. And so that is working and we can look at, now let's go ahead and look back at Docker and see what it looks like in Docker desktop. And what we can see here is uh, this one. There's the random name for the container locally, Keen Benz. Here's the image it's running off and you can see the status and we can control it from here if we want. Uh, you can you know view details, pause, restart, stop, all that stuff. So. You know, Docker Desktop is a nice UI on top of Docker commands that you can that you can also use control. Now, remember, I can start multiple containers. So let's go and open up random tab here in my terminal. Uh, so this is full. Where am I? Okay. So simple flask server container. Docker run. 
<laughs> port is already a lot. Well, that's true. Yeah, you can't expose it. So this is a confusing thing. If I needed to change the port, you actually change the first argument. It goes external to internal. I think this should work. Okay. Yeah. So now we've got two of them running, but they're exposed on two different ports within my local host. Uh, so this one is, even though it claims it's on, this is the internal port. So in the container, it thinks it's on 50505, but I've exposed it as 50506. So this is something that can trick you up um, is the the publishing your ports and and keeping track of what you know what port is exposed where. So it's usually easiest if you can just use the same port throughout. But of course, if I'm running multiple apps on my local host, I can't have them all on the same port. Uh, so let's go ahead and look back at Docker Desktop. Now we see another container. This one is trusting Gagarin. And it's also running the Flask app image. And, uh, you know, we can look at the details here and, uh, you know, see, and we can see here the port that it's exposed on if we forgot what we used. Okay. Question, questions on that before. Y'all have such good comments and questions. All right, right. Uh, so that, okay, we ran it. You could also run from here, right? Anytime, uh, like here, this one I think has a run command. Uh, so, oh no, run is on the actual tag. Yeah, run, run. Uh, and there's lots of options. So do use the Docker reference because you'll find lots of options. So for example, there's just run interactive. If you needed to run your container, but then be inside the container, like inside a kind of like a shell, then you would want to do run interactive. Uh, and some other stuff there that I don't really use. Uh, but the Docker reference is great if you ever have questions about these commands. Okay. All right. Well, we have an exercise. Uh, let me see if I can. Uh, I think Don said that they've actually already got it running. But let's let's see. I'm going to try seeing if I can bring Don on to share share their experience, see what they're doing. Because basically the exercise, so if you're, you know, we're trying to make this be an actual workshop. Um, so part of the workshop is actually, you know, doing, you know, doing the doing the work as it would be. Uh, so the exercise is basically, you know, like doing what I just did and then try, you know, changing things and seeing what happens uh, when you do a rebuild and a rerun. Uh, so my thought was to try to uh, bring someone on stage in order to show them going through the steps and see if any other questions come up while they're going through it. And that would give all of you time to go through it as well. Let's see if this works. Mm -hmm. Let's see. seeing if I can get if I can get on stage okay let's see we're seeing if we can get Don on stage here in the meantime if you have any questions um keep asking questions and I'll once again link to the repo and to our current state in the slides for anyone tuning in now. Has anyone managed to follow along and uh, get it working while you follow along as well? Do, do, do. 
Okay, let's see. <laughs> oh, we got David in the G Unicorn docs. Very good. Let me go. I'm going to show the Docker reference while we're trying to get this working. Um, Docker reference. So there's a few different Docker references. There's like the Docker, you know, commands reference, right? So you could do like Docker build reference here. And that's got all the arguments for Docker build. And then Docker run is down here. So though these are useful references, but also the other thing is the Docker file reference. Like, so what is the syntax of a Docker file? And you know, the stuff I always look at is like expose, because I always you know forget the exact uh, you know syntax, and also like with this publish command here, you know which one's first. Uh, so these are the references that you want to have easily available: is Docker run, Docker build, Docker file. I see a question about. Uh, Docker Compose. We are going to do Docker Compose as the second part of this workshop. So we will talk all about Docker Compose. All right. It looks like I got Don here. Nice. Okay. I just clicked add to stage. Do I like, I need to like put you somewhere. Oh, oh cool. Look at this. <laughs> oh, look at this. <laughs> uh, all right. Don. And then Don, can you, does it let you share your screen? Yeah. Okay. Let me share. And I'm at the part where I've published. Am I behind? Oh, I mean, if you've done anything, you're ahead. <laughs> okay, good. Okay. Uh, so this see. is Don. Don was uh, Bor the Borgeron. Oh, I can't pronounce it. Sorry. This is a Star Wars reference, right? Bajoran engineer. Yeah. <laughs> Star Trek. DSM. Yeah, my uh, my four year old discovered this R two D two operation game where you have to like extract, you know parts from an rtd2 and now she's like i really want to watch star wars i'm like no i don't want to it's so boring <laughs> star trek seems more fun okay um so is this is that your machine or my machine i can't even no that looks like my machine okay oh i see yours okay let's add this that. is mine okay there we go okay so where are you at here so you are in code spaces okay yes cool and all I'm right publish Okay, you did that. All right, so are you able to um, view your view your app? Yeah, I think. Let's go. Cool, cool. Is it on the other? Did it open somewhere else? No. Did it? Yeah, Open. when you're in code spaces, it's there. You go. Like it's gonna auto convert the local host URL into the code space. URL, right? Because you can't. Yeah. Actually, if you're in Codespace. Local host okay. is not going to work. But if you if you click on a local host URL, it's very clever, and it automatically converts it for you. Cool. And yeah, I did Control Click, and it opened yes. that module thing. Yeah, that's working. Do you want to show port visibility? Because then you could actually share your. You could put that in the chat. <laughs> okay. Uh, and that is ports. Yeah. And haha. Which one should I do? This five oh five oh. 50505, yep. And then to do the visibility, mm -hmm. I just right clicked. I don't know. There you go. Public. I don't know if that's the best way, but I right clicked mm -hmm. to do that. Yeah. And then others can do it now, I guess. Yeah. So now you can actually, uh, you could actually share that in the chat. I just think this is a cool yeah. thing you can do with there those courses where you can actually share your, your public uh, board. So here, it's like multiple layers of publishing where it's like, okay, we had the inside the container, it's got its own little network and it's running on 50505. And then we told Docker like, okay, now expose 50505, you know, within this code space local container, right? So that worked. And now we're telling it like, okay, now expose this whole uh, app to to the world, right? Um, so uh, it, yeah, we were like, we just... We keep publishing our ports further and further. Great, yeah. So you could, <laughs> you could post that in the in the chat, and it would just work. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, so let's see. In the exercise, we said try changing the base image to a higher Python version number, and rebuilding or rerunning. Okay. Uh, so that'll be three twelve. Yeah, or if you want to go hard, you could go 313, but I don't know if it's gonna work. <laughs> That's exciting. Okay, I I, I love that. Okay. Uh, okay, I saved, control S, works in dev containers. 
Oh, control C to end it. And I just run the same command or I got to rebuild. You got to rebuild. Okay. Not found. Oh, maybe it's like so special. Maybe they made it special because. Oh, and it could be like B something something because it's yeah, also not. It was, I'm going to look and see Python. Okay. Wait, we're, we're just getting, we're, we're too modern here. 3.13. Oh yeah. You have to do like this, like dot zero A2. Yeah. Dot zero A2. Ah. Yeah. And that was autocomplete. So that was cool. Did it really? I don't even know where it was autocompleting from. <laughs> Probably like Copilot or something. I would be so surprised if Copilot knew about 082, but you know, one never knows. Okay, so yeah, it did. It brought brought down that new image. It's actually pretty fast to bring that one down. Yeah, I am on FiOS. So <laughs> <laughs> on you're on what now? FiOS, FiOS on what um a, like a fiber optic cable for internet. Oh. I, I'm, I'm new. I'm but we're in the code so. space. So they, I, I mean, I'm doing it right. It's not even about me. I am it's, jealous of your fiber. Um, <laughs> but uh, I don't think that, I think that wouldn't affect the code space because the code yeah, space. Don't totally know. Right. Okay. And okay, now you built it. So now you can publish it. And now we're going to find out if Flask works in 3.13. <laughs> okay. But this is like the bleeding edge. This we're doing a service for the community as we well. Are. Right. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. Does it work? Will it run? I think you, you just click on it, right? You oh, oh, yeah, it. right. Okay. <laughs> I was like, is it ready? Okay, yeah. It's, Yay! It's there we go. All right. So Flask is ready for 313. Done. Okay. Right. So you did that. And then the next step is try changing the HTML code and and then do another rebuild rerun. Okay. It's giving me a warning about my key bindings, which I think is very, very helpful. I love that. Oh, control C. To turn it on okay and then html let's do the index page it says hello world um let's be more specific we're on earth yeah <laughs> <laughs> i don't know is that helpful we just okay. watched the sesame street where the martians discover earth and go earth 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 yip 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 yay I don't know that one. Okay, that's very cute. Throwbacks. Um, and so we do not need to build again. Oh, because scuba there. Oh, yeah. Um, no, we do need to build. Okay. Yeah, because we've changed something that's part of the, uh, you know, the Docker file layers. So okay. um, I, I'll, I'll show how we can avoid that in the next section. But for now, we need to re rebuild. Perfect. Okay. You mentioned Scuba Sarah. <laughs> yes, Scuba Sarah points out that the autocomplete might be coming from the Docker extension, which makes a lot of sense. So that's another plus one for having a Docker extension. Okay, so let's just take a look at what was cached. So you can see this time it did, you know, everything was cached except that last step of copying over the application code because that's the only part you changed. Oh, nice. Okay. Now you can rerun. Yep, 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 yay. <laughs> I'm going to watch that this weekend. I also have an infant niece, so uh, I like these recommendations. All right, let's run it or uh, click Wait. on it. Ah. Hello, Earth. All right. You did it. 100%. A, A plus. Uh, so cool. It worked. Good. Any questions that came up during that? Not really. I'm just excited and amazed. This is my first time actually running Flask. Like, ever. Oh, well, welcome to the Flask community. Uh, <laughs> we're, we love bringing more folks in. Uh, so great. Yeah. I'm going to be a great. Palace fan. Thanks for having me. Is this a, or do you have more to do on live? Uh, so this is it for this exercise. Okay. If you're still around later, I'll bring you back for Docker Compose. Cool. I'm hanging out. Right. Thank you, Don. Bye. All right. Oh, let me add mine back to stage. Cool. Okay. So now we've seen that someone was able to successfully go through the exercise. Thank you, Don, for demonstrating that. So I do encourage you to try this out. If you haven't yet, uh, you can do it now. You can do it later um, just to get your hands wet with this stuff. Yeah, so do is pointing out that we have to rebuild the image every time our project is changed. That's true. We do with the way that I've got it set up here. But I will show how we can avoid that 
when we're using Docker Compose. So let's go and get into Docker Compose. Uh, so our motivation for using Docker and Compose is actually going to be having databases in our containers, especially when developing locally. But we're also going to be able to do some other things like avoiding rebuilds. Uh, so for this one, we are going to be using a different app because this, this one is going to be a little fancier. It's got a database in it. We're using uh, Postgres with SQL Alchemy and Flash SQL Alchemy. So this is the one that uh, this is the repo we're going to be using. Uh, so I will, this one I already have a code space open. So I'm going to open up that existing one. Restart code space. <clears throat> this code space does take a little longer to start up if you're starting up a code space with this uh, because there's just more going on. <clears throat> okay, so this database here, yeah, this is a survey application where we've got We've got models, SQL Alchemy models. We're using Flask SQL Alchemy. You know, so it looks like a Flask app with a database. So how do we deal with databases when it comes to containers? Or generally, how do you deal with data persistence? So you can write data to a container's file system. But the thing is that when you remove the container, that data would then be gone, right? Because the, you, removing the container, stopping the container, that just means the that deletes it, right? Uh, if you wanted to try and port the container data, you know, like right before you stop a container, it's generally difficult to move between environments. Like they haven't really optimized the experience of moving data from a container to another container. Uh, and then also generally container storage drives are less performant because they're just not designed with the idea that they'd be storing, storing data. So basically, you don't want to write data to a container's file system. If you do need to persist data, you should store it outside the container because then it will actually legitimately be persistent and you can store it somewhere where it's actually you know, performant and optimized for data storage, which is important if you're actually dealing with a real production database. So the way we can do that, uh, there's actually two ways of doing a Docker, but the more modern way is a volume. Uh, I think the, the other way is a mount. Uh, so with a volume, a volume is a directory on the host machine that is mapped to a directory in the container. So you can imagine that Docker basically has carved out part of your file system and said, oh, these are for me to use as volumes. And then you can tell it like, hey, for this, you know, when this container starts, I want it's, you know, the, the data in this directory of the container to actually be stored on my file. It looks like, oh, okay. Looks like I briefly, so I'll just repeat. Just went out. Okay. So when you are developing with databases locally, you're gonna wanna use a volume to store the data for the database. When you're going into production, that may not be the case because actually in production, in not all production environments support using volumes. So in production, it's going to depend a lot on what cloud you're using. If you're in Azure, or AWS, or Google, or some other one, uh, then you're not necessarily going to use volumes. So in production, it is going to be a different story. But for development, we definitely want to use a volume. Uh, so we're going to show how to run Postgres uh, with Docker and a volume. And first, I'm going to show you the hard way. Feel free to not follow along with the hard way because we will soon do it the easy way. But I want to show you the the step by step way so you can understand, uh, you know, each step that's happening and then understand why we, you know, why the the better way is better. So the first step is to create a volume. So to tell Docker like, hey, we're gonna have this volume. So you know, carve out a little bit of the Docker volumes for a volume named this. So I'm gonna run this command here. Docker volume create, and then I can see uh, actually in the Docker extension for VS Code, uh, we can see that that volume has been made here, Postgres data. Let me make this a little bigger, okay. Then we create a network. So this is a Docker network that the Postgres container and the app container are gonna communicate over. So it's nice for them to have their own 
shared network for them to communicate with each other because then you don't necessarily have to expose them both to the world. Uh, you could just have them communicate over their own shared network and only expose the app. So, in the network list here, to there we go, PostgresNet. You can see it here. It is a bridge style network. There are different kinds of Docker networks. The default is bridge. So there we go, we've got our network, we've got our volume. Now we're going to run a container using that volume and network and it's gonna be a Postgres container. So, you know, remember on Docker Hub, we did find that there is a, you know, official Postgres image. So this is the image we're going to be using. So we'll run a container based off this image and it has documentation about what environment variables it expects. So, you know, if you want to set the password, you have to pass in this environment variable here and then it'll use it. Uh, so we're going to say, okay, run this container. It's going to use this volume. All right. And you, what you see here is a volume mapping. So we're saying map this directory on the container to this Docker volume on the host machine. So this is where Postgres defaults to trying to store data. So when it does it there, it's actually going to be stored in a volume on the host machine, which is this volume. Then we tell it what network it's going to use. Uh, we can name the container. We pass in the environment variables, which is the user and the password that we want to use. And then finally, we say it's going to run the Postgres image. So that's the public Postgres image. So this whole long command, I'm going to put it over here. And it is now running. So we can look and find that uh, container there. So we can see the Postgres container is now running. So we didn't have to build the image because we are using the public Postgres image. So we were able to jump straight to the running step because we're using that public Postgres image. All right, so now Postgres is running, but now we wanna start up our app to have it communicate with Postgres. Uh, so we're going to uh, make an env file for the database connection, and it needs to map what is being used by the Postgres image. So you can see app user, app password. That's the same thing I passed in here. Uh, the DB host, instead of being local host, it's actually DB. So when a app is communicating with uh, you know, a database over a Docker network, it doesn't use localhost, it uses the name of the container, right? So we named that container DB. And so that's actually how it's gonna connect to it is using that name here. So instead of localhost, which is what you you know might normally have, it's gonna be the name of the running container. And then the rest of these match what that container has in its, its side, its environment as well. So we've got that .env inside our app folder here. Uh, now we're going to go inside that app folder. So I'm going to source and I'm going to do a Docker build. So I am going to build because I'm, you know, I have to build, you know, my actual app. So it's not a public one. It's the app. So we can here, we've got a bit of a longer, <laughs> bit of a longer uh, Python file here. Oh, it looks like I am successfully using slim here. So that's cool. So you can see a usage of slim. Um, I installed some additional things for for Postgres, so these are helpful for Postgres. Uh, I've got copying the application code. Um, I have some stuff here, which I can talk about later. And then for entry point, I actually put my entry point in a shell script. That's another option you have if you're getting tired of writing really long, weird commands in a list of probably is gonna have a G-Unicorn command in it. Okay, so this is the shell script. The shell script has, uh, it's a pretty, you know, it's just doing a data function, flash go out Alembic, and then a G-Unicorn command with the app. So this is for, so the addition is just doing the database migration. All right, and so that is what it built. Uh, so fortunately, a lot of it was cached because I did do this earlier today and it has that image built.
So we built the image. Now we need to run the app container over the same network as the Postgres. So they're going to be connected over the same network and, and nothing else is going to be using that network. So we tell it the network. Uh, we're going to name this one as well. We're going to expose the ports and we're going to tell it which image to use. All right, it is running. I'm gonna open it. All right, it is running and it actually already has data in it from when I ran this earlier today. And the reason that data is still there is because it is in the volume. Right. Um, so even though that was a, you know, a you know, fresh image build, fresh container, the data is still there because it's in the volume. Uh, so here we have our survey app. I can go ahead and, and uh, expose this port so all of you can take my very important survey. And there's only two options. <laughs> Maybe I should make a new survey. Uh, fave ice cream. My surveys are always about ice cream. All right, we got mint chip. Pistachio. Somebody always wants butter pecan for some reason. Chocolate, chocolate chip, uh, strawberry, vanilla, other. Okay, here we go. All right, and I think that you should all be able to hit up that URL because I did expose that port on Code Space, so that'll be running as long as I'm running that container, which might not be for very long. So you should really hit that up now. <laughs> Uh, oh, issue. We got a SQL Alchemy warning. I actually haven't seen that one before, so I'll have to look through that. <laughs> I see. But so, butter pecan is a staple. So, let's see if I can. Oh, I need to answer this first. I'm going to submit it so that and then I can see the results. It's uh, it's really it's tight here. It's neck and neck, mint chip and strawberry. You got to represent. <laughs> All right. So, that worked. It's clearly working. Um, but it was a pain, right? We had to run so many commands and it's, you know, we would rather be able to just define this setup declaratively and be able to just always run this setup with a single command, right? Now you could do that with a shell script, but the more elegant way is to use a docker compose.yaml. And this is what, you know, various folks have talked about uh, in the chat. So here is a somewhat like basically a minimal version of the docker compose.yaml based off those commands I did. So in in a Docker Compose, you have uh, services, and uh, I actually think, is that in, I think I indented that wrong. wrong. Let me see. Yeah, it's slightly indented wrong. Uh, I'll just fix it right now. Uh, let me see. Can I in, just fix this indent? Did that work? I don't know. No. But okay. So, oh, that looks horrible. <laughs> All right, so in the Docker Compose, you've got services, right? So these are the services, and we've got the two services. These are basically the containers, all right? We've got the DB container and the app container. So with the DB container, we're telling it to run off the Postgres image, and we're passing in some environment variables, but what volume mapping to use, and then we assign it to a network. That's equivalent to the commands that we run. The app container, we're telling it to do a build. So you can have it do that build step and we just tell it, you know, where to find the Docker file. Uh, we tell it which ports to expose because we do want to expose our, our ports. And we tell it that it's using this Postgres net. Uh, and then we, at the bottom, we declare our volumes and declare our networks. So you do need actually a little bit more than this, um, but I try to, you know, fit it on the slide. First, let's check in with our survey. Oh, mint chip winning. That's what I thought. You all get cookies. Well, mint chip cookies. Okay, so let's look at the real, the real one, because this is where it gets real interesting. So here's our actual Docker Compose. The uh, things I want to point out is we've added a health check. This is necessary because what can happen is if you start off the Postgres service and immediately start up the app, the Postgres database may not be ready. So what you need to have is a health check to check to see is the Postgres database actually legit ready. So this is uh, this is a health check that checks to see if Postgres is ready. So there's actually a PG is ready command, very conveniently. 
Uh, so we pass in the database user and database name, and it'll keep on pinging that every five seconds, and it'll try it five times until it's ready. And that's that for me has been good enough. That that always works. Uh, I also want to point out the you know environment variables here. So it defaults to looking for a .env. So if you have a .env and we've got a .env here, it will look for db pass, db user, db name inside a .env. So that's a way that you can have a .env get referenced by Docker Compose so you can you know have environment variables. And you can have default values here uh, if if it can't find it in the .env file. Uh, I see David has a question. What is the best practice to deal with environment variables in Docker? Is the best thing an EMV file? So locally, I use a .env file because it's you know it's nice and declarative, and and I always make sure that it's not going to you know get checked into source control, right? So uh, always make sure it's in my git ignore, um, you know, just in case. Like in this case, this is not su super secure information, but sometimes people might put in the connection information for a real Postgres database for whatever reason they might. Uh, so I always make sure I don't check it into source control. So locally I use .envs. Uh, in production, I don't use .envs because typically the production hosts that I use have their own way of specifying environment variables. So you, usually they have like, like something that you would configure in the, like an infrastructure file or in your deploy command or something like that where you would you know, specify those environment variables. So I, I always use environment variables, uh, but usually I'm using .env locally and then using um, whatever the cloud equivalent is for my cloud hosting provider. Yeah, and David also says in terms of security, right? So yeah, so .env is fine if it's in your Gatenor. I guess what I would say in terms of security, this is what you know we're trying to move away from passwords. So here you can see a password, but many um, many services have ways of not using passwords. So when I'm like deploying to Azure, I try to not actually use passwords. I use something called managed identity for Azure. I'm sure the other clouds have the equivalent as well. So just look for keyless authentication. That's the term to look for is the idea of not using or passwordless authentication, like not using keys, not using passwords, if there's some other way that you can confirm who you are so that you don't have keys. Keys are just a bad idea. Like I talked about this uh, in another recent blog post. Um, uh, this one. Uh, and here I was talking specifically about OpenAI chat apps. Um, but if I can go keyless, I'd rather go keyless because then I don't even have to risk anyone accidentally exposing their .env files and all the other risks that have to do with having passwords and keys. Because passwords and keys can be passed around. You don't really want things that can be passed around. For local, like none of this stuff really matters, um, but it really matters if you're dealing with anything that's at production. Uh, Knox said, why not use Docker secrets? That's a great question probably because i don't know about docker secrets so we're gonna as in, i'm learning more stuff about um docker all the time so today we're gonna learn about docker secrets i assume this is some sort of key vault uh so Docker secrets essentially manage this data so is it a hosted or is it local uh how docker manages secrets oh cool so maybe a volume docker secret okay Fantastic. So this is probably a, a good thing to use for your actual secrets. So maybe instead of having like DB pass here, uh, I would put that in a secret, right? Because if you do have to use keys, then yeah, you definitely want to use something like this, which is going to make it hard for you to accidentally expose a secret. So it's going to encrypt it, make it hard to, to inspect it all the time, maybe make it easy to do rotation or get notified about when to change it. Um, so that is great. Thank you for uh, pointing that out. Let's link to that. Here's about how you manage your environments or your secrets with Docker, please do post those in the chat. I'm going to see if I can improve my neck briefly. 
Um, Oh, my network is having a hard time here. All right. I need to move to fiber like Don. We just had fiber coming to our neighborhood this month, actually. All right, let's see if I'm in. Okay. All right. Uh, so let's see, we were looking at dot .emv, Docker Compose. Okay. Uh, so yeah, we talked about the health check here. If you do have a health check for something, you then need to have a depends on for whatever depends on that service. So an app where I say depends on database condition service healthy. So that basically means it's gonna run that health check and once it's successful, that's when it's going to trigger the entry point for, for this app here. Uh, and now another thing I wanna point out is entry point, I've overridden it. So this is another reason why it's a fun idea to uh, when you're doing the Docker file to actually point at a, at a script because you can swap out an entry point. So we can swap out, you know, entry point dot sh with entry point dev dot sh. And so you can see the difference is really just the G unicorn dash dash reload. Uh, but that's really nice because this is how we're going to get hot reload of the of the code as we're changing it in combination with another thing we're going to do. Um, versus our production one, we do not want to be doing dash dash reload when we're in productions, right? So there's no dash dash reload here. So that's another thing you can do with a Docker Compose. If you were using a Docker Compose for, like you had one for dev and one for production, you could swap out that entry point there. Um, here, I actually pointed at a dot .env, um, so it knows about that one. I think we didn't actually have to do that because this is the default. So I think that's actually, we could remove that. Uh, let's see, we got, and then we've got the volumes and networks down here. Now, the, the thing I want to point out here is I have another volume for the app. And this is so that we can have hot reload of our code. And because this was something like Abdullah was talking about, like, oh, do we have to rebuild every time we do the code? If we do this, what we're doing is we're mapping source locally. So this is, um, this is the source folder here. We're mapping that to slash code in the container. So that should mean that we can change something in our code. And then because we've done G unicorn dash dash reload, it should hopefully, it should notice that we changed something because it's actually, we're, we're storing our code in a volume on the host machine. So it should notice we changed it and it should reload. So let's see if that's actually working. Um, so we're gonna do, well, first we need to actually run the Docker compose command. Oh, I should, have, I'll, I'll see the survey. Okay. So uh, it's very easy to run it. You do docker dash compose up. Oh, it's a little hard to <laughs> exit out of this because there's so many workers running. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We go to my docker containers, go to the individual containers running here. We can say stop. Stop that container. Actually, we could stop all these containers. Stop that one. Uh, stop. Yeah, we shouldn't need any of them running. Okay, so I stopped all the running containers and now I can do docker dash compose up. Oh, I wanna do it from actually from here, from the root folder, cause that's where I've got my docker compose. I've got it in the root folder. So you can see it says starting the DB and starting the app and we can see logs from the Postgres, uh, Postgres container. We can also see logs from the app container. Uh, it says I messed up my command. Uh, I think that was just dash C. She don't even need that. All right, entry point dev. Run this again. Okay, there we go. All right, so first let's confirm that it is working. All right, it is working. Now you see, I actually, that cleared out my survey data because this is actually using a different volume than the one I created manually. So I'd have to make a, a new survey. Uh, and uh, 
so switching all right just trying to improve my network here okay all right, so that is running. So the big question is, if I change some code locally, all right, so what can I change? I can just say, you know, add some exclamation mark here. Okay, so I did some exclamations. And now question is, is G Unicorn gonna notice the reload? Looks like it hasn't noticed it yet. That's in the templates. Let me actually try changing, you know, test change file. Okay. All right, there we go. Okay, so that's interesting. So it looked like it didn't notice my template change, but it did definitely notice my Python file change, which would have then reloaded everything. So let's try here. So now it reloaded. Okay, so I'll have to check to see. Um, I want to try the template change once again to see if we can get it to trigger on that, but it might be that, oh, uh, change, 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 change. Okay, David is saying, I'm not sure if Unicorn looks at the templates. I think that's probably what's happening here because I don't think it's reloading with that, um, but it is change, change, change. It's definitely noticing the PY. Okay, so so that's interesting. Um, if anybody has ideas about how to get it to trigger based off the template change, that would be that'd be good to know because that would probably improve the development experience. If you're specifically working on templates, like you're doing some UI changes, uh, but you do have you know a workaround where you could you know change something else about the code. Cool. So that's at least a much better experience than earlier where we had to rebuild the image every single time we wanted to change to see changes. Now, the other thing you can do is that you don't have to be like, I think everyone's development varies. Like you don't have to be necessarily, you know, using uh, this full on Docker, uh, you know, Docker for when you're doing local development. Like locally, a lot of times I will just do a, you know, a flask run command instead uh because locally i don't need to have five you know five workers or you know how many workers per core uh so you could also you know do your standard flash development and then be using docker you know when you're getting ready to put it into production and and hosting and stuff like that uh the other thing is that you can use you know for if you are developing you want to take advantage of containers you can use dev containers which is a way of creating Docker files that describe your development environment and then kind of putting you inside that container. That's actually how I often develop. And I do talk about that in tomorrow's talk about VS using VS Code with Flask. So if you are interested in using Docker containers for your development environment, I talk about that in tomorrow's talk. Um, but yeah, all right. So that it kind of brings us to the final exercise. Let's see. If Don is still around and wants to try upping on the stage. Oh, there, I see, I see Don. All right, we got Don. And Don, let's get a, can you do a screen share? Yeah, I'm gonna be real. Uh, I didn't uh, keep all the way up. No worries. There was one thing that brought <laughs> Okay. I knew you'd help me through it. Nice. Okay. Uh, yeah. So Abdullah says, well, so what we saw is that G Unicorn did detect the changes in the Python files, but not the templates. Uh, so I think that's something I have to look into more in terms of having a really nice development experience. If you are using Docker, Docker and Compose, I think there's probably got to be some way to do it. Okay, so Don, what stage are we at? Docker Compose up. Okay. And then so, I didn't do the password part. I couldn't remember exactly yeah. what to do. Yeah. Okay. 
So um, what you can do is I made it really easy. There's a .env.example file. Do you see that? Yes. And I did uh, that and I copied it over. Ah, uh, you've got it in your source. Okay, so this yes. was just this is just the difference between because when we were doing the earlier steps, I was building inside the source folder, but I put mm. the Docker Compose at the root, as mm -hmm. so it just means just copy or just drag that .env into the root. Ah, uh, okay, okay, cool. Yeah, I was debating like how to do this. This was something I was playing with this morning, and um, so okay. uh, usually I would just have it at the root because I have the Docker Compose at the root. Um, yeah, it, it, yeah. Anyway, but now should I pull it off screen so I can get passwords or no? Yeah, I know it's all. I mean, this is all local, so yes. Okay, right. All right, now it should work. No, nope, that's why. All right. Dark oh, oh yes. Okay, there you go. Dun, 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 dun. And yeah. usually, when it says you can't find it, it means it's in the wrong place. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just having a hard time deciding what to do about that .env, right? Because, um, you know, it defaults to looking for a .env in the current folder. Mm -hmm. And so I happen to have this repo set up where I've got the Docker file in the source folder, but I've got the Docker Compose in the root. You know, I could have Six put the Docker Compose in one hand, half a dozen in the yeah. other. It's, yeah. It's hard to decide on, you know, folder architecture. Because I am trying to move towards, you know, what's called like the source layout for applications where I put the like the application inside a source because that way if mm -hmm. you do start having a project that has like kind of multiple aspects of it you know multiple backends or you know microservices or whatever you want to call it uh, you can mm -hmm. potentially have them all live inside the same repo and uh, mm -hmm. and so you'd have like a, a you know a folder for each of them and that's kind of like the is that the same kind of theory that you people use when they have app configs, for example? They there's been a move to like having one file where it's not, I don't know if it's particularly in there. In Django, there's uh we've moved to an app config type mm -hmm. setting where a lot of the settings are in one file mm -hmm. and then it not just the managed up. Anyway, I'm trying to yeah, understand. Yeah, so that, I mean that's generally uh that I think that was like a related thing so that's what i call like the 12 actor 12 factor app methodology there's a manifesto yes. about it and the idea is that you have uh you control everything via environment variables instead of mm. having like the situation before we would have like a config for development a config for testing a config for production and you just have this tendency for things to get out of date with each other and then it's like hard if you have like a slightly different environment, then you need a whole new config file. So the idea of the the twelve factor app is that everything is specified in your environment variables, and then you that does stuff based off those environment variables. Cool. Oh, you have such great explanations. Ah, awesome. Thank you. Sure. All right. So does this work? Let's try yes. clicking on that that line there where it says listening to. Uh -huh. Yay. All right, very good. Now you can create a new survey. Mm -hmm. um, mm, While you're doing that, so I'm gonna look through the comments here. So we've got lots of people commenting about how to get GUnicorn to watch. So Adam says that GUnicorn has a config option for extra files, uh, reload extra files list. Okay, so it looks like there is, there's a way we can make this work. Um, and Abdullah asked about setting the bug true to the app configuration. Is that needed for hot reload? That's a good question. So with we're doing Flask here. Um, Flask, when you do debug true, the big thing that does is that instead of serving a 500 page, it would do like an exception, uh, like show you the exception in your logs. I believe that's the, the distinction with debug. So, um, you know, you generally do want to be running into bug when you're locally, but that is distinct from hot reload. So you could have hot reload and not debug. Because uh, we're also doing the hot reload via G Unicorn in this case. Um, so you you don't I don't you don't you shouldn't have to be in debug mode to have the reload. Uh, but we do usually want to use debug mode with Flask development when we're local. Uh, in order to be able to get nice exceptions and not just see a 500 page. Ooh, favorite type of app. Okay, now can you expose your port and share your survey? Mm 
All right. And then, oh, I guess you probably can't post URLs in the chat, but you can post it to me in our in our chat. And then I can post it in the chat. <laughs> Do you want to put it in the Teams chat so I can share it, right? Because I think you probably can't post it in the StreamYard. StreamYard gets all picky about stuff. There we go. All right, now I can post it here. Oh, then let me make sure it works for me. Oh, it's got a nice little warning now too. That's cool. That's good. They should do that. Okay. <laughs> all right. And yeah, I was able to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show the warning because that, that's cool to show that. All right. Well, you did it, Don. That's, I think that's actually all I had for that part of the exercise. So well done. Dr. Hey, Hoda. you made it. It works. And now you've got your first flak, Flask app that uses SQL Alchemy and Postgres. So, I'm so excited. you're well on your way into the Flask world. Okay. Thank you so much, Don, for joining for both these exercises. Bye, y'all. Thanks for having me. All right, so here is what it looks like when I am accessing Don's development port. So I can continue. And this is just useful for like sharing with colleagues or classmates or whatever. So I'll go to the survey page and then favorite type of pet. I'm a cat person. Uh, so yeah, 100% cats. <laughs> so, so there you go. And once she stops running the, you know, if, if Don exits out of the Docker Compose, it, you know, this, this survey page will no longer work. Um, and, and if she exits the code space, it definitely won't work. But it's fun for development. So yeah, we did see some comments about G Unicorn extra files. So let's go ahead and find that in the documentation. Extra files. Oh, let's, let me try something else. Extra reload, extra files. Extra reload, extra files. There we go. Extends reload option to also watch and reload on additional files. So my question is, do I have to specify each individual file? <laughs> Or is it, can I do a template? It doesn't, it defaults to an empty list. So if anyone um, has actual examples of how you've used that, because we'd probably want to put it inside here and then, you know, say like, um, I don't know if this is going to work equals, I mean, I can start with just a straight up, is that going to work? Let's see. Let's see if that command works. You need to specify each file. My gosh. <laughs> uh, if anyone wants to, oh, okay, okay. You can use a glob. Okay. Globs are my favorite. Um, all right. So it didn't like unrecognized arguments, reload extra files. Am I using what version of um, G Unicorn am I using? I'm on 21.2.0. It's new in version 19.8, reload dash extra dash file. Oh, so that's annoying is that it's different in, in the Python. Oh, in the Python. So we could do it in the Python. Oh, so this is a great reason to use a gunicorn.com. Okay, so we could, oh, but that's tricky because, all right. So this is what you'd want to do. You want to have a gunicorn.com for your dev. And then I guess one for your prod, or you could somehow like look at an environment file to decide whether you're in prod or dev. Cause right now I'm using the same gunicorn.com for prod and dev, and then just overwriting in this command here. Um, but yeah, it looks like it'd be a little nicer experience uh, if we do here and it's gonna be like backend slash templates slash base.html. So I'm just gonna do it single one for now and then i'll get rid of it here but keep in mind we wouldn't want this for production so either have two configurations or use an environment variable to decide okay yeah you use os on right so you could do something like if os.environ.get you know uh 
you know, yeah, something that indicates you're in development. I don't actually use Flascam because I think we, I think we deprecated that, that Flask deprecated that, but some sort of thing that said, you know, I actually have one that's usually indicates I'm in production, like running in production. Uh, so you can decide, you know, how you're going to do that. So if not running in production, you could do that. Okay. Oh, okay. Look at this. Look at this. Wow. It's even reloading. Um, oh, because it does reload with a Python file, of course. But now what we want to see is our common. And that worked. Okay. All right. Great. So it looks like the, the way to do it is, um, is to use this reload extra files, to use it with uh, pathlib glob so you can uh, specify your templates and to you know only do this in development so i'll work on improving uh, this sample so that it it does that uh, but that's something that you can use in your own apps so that was a fantastic tip thank you adam and and david for that so cool it's just so great to get to learn more things all right, so this is actually brings me to the end of the workshop. What to learn next? Uh, so you can figure learn about deploying containers to the cloud. Uh, since I work for Microsoft, I usually show how to deploy to Azure, but this is not sponsored by Microsoft. So there are container offerings across all the clouds, and they're all actually tend to be fairly similar. Like I've I've tried them in Amazon and Google and and Azure. Uh, so uh, you know you can usually find some place to put your container. Um, I don't know if other ones, you know, y'all can recommend those of you who have deployed containers to production, where are you deploying them? Like what recommendations do you have to people? Uh, but basically like all these cloud providers are going to have a way for you to deploy a container because it's just such a, a, a good form of portability. All right, you could learn about using Kubernetes to manage containers. I actually personally haven't used Kubernetes myself, but Kubernetes is a container orchestration. So if you have like, lots of containers, lots of services, and you need like fancy scaling rules and uh, you know lots of sophistication around your container management, then you may want to use Kubernetes. Uh, I usually get away with using you know uh, just managed services and platforms for my containers. Uh, but I do want to learn Kubernetes soon. You can also use dev containers for local development. So I do talk about that in my talk for FlaskCon tomorrow. And there's also lots of resources about that. And I also want to recommend there's this great website. I think it's contain no, not container, uh, containers training. Uh, let's see. Gosh. It's this really nice. Containers training. Oh, now I can't even find it. Oh, it was this really great set of tutorials. I'll have to find it again. Uh, it's not this one. There's some other site. Well, uh, there are some great resources out there for learning more about containers. And uh, I do recommend learning more as saying I, I learn more all the time. Uh, so that is the end of the workshop. If there's any additional questions, happy to answer them now thank you all for coming for the great engagement great questions thank you don for coming on stage and uh, we look forward to seeing you at the rest of flascon so this will be it for today if today is friday for you and then we will be continuing on tomorrow with lots and lots of talks starting at 7 utc uh we'll have adam who saw in the chat adam's gonna be talking about court which I mentioned quite a bit. So I'm very excited for Adam's talk. Uh, I'll be talking about VS Code for Flask. Uh, my colleague Jay is talking here. We've got Socket.io. So just lots of really, uh, really interesting talks across all of, all of Flask and all the different ways people use Flask. So yeah, we'll see you tomorrow. And if you have any follow-up questions, you know, put it in the Palettes Discord. That's where we are, at, you know, lots of the time. And it's a great place for your fast questions. Also, great questions, a great place to answer questions. So if you know something, share it with the community. Okay, thank you, everyone.